Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us for another one of these sessions with regard to Javed Ahmed Ghamadi's counter narrative to the traditional narrative on religion and the state. Uh, up to this point, if you have been following along, we've gone through a discussion of the traditional narrative as, as Ghamdi understands it, and then have started working through uh, the 10 key salient points that Ghamdi has, uh, critiquing the counter narrative or main ideas of the counter narrative uh, on the relationship between religion and the state. Now, these are just the 10 key points. There, there are other points that Ramdi also raises that discuss or can be found in, in sort of his more extensive discussions in, in, his, in his work. Uh, but for our purposes, we are going to focus on these because that's what he focused on when he gave uh, a series of lectures in Dallas in 2015, expanding on the points that he made in the article that he published uh, earlier or prior to that that got, was published in Pakistan in both Urdu and English that laid out his critique of the traditional narrative on religion and the state. So up to this point, we had really just gone through the two uh, initial points. And so with regard to the second point that we discussed in the last session, um, that Ramdi noted was the idea. What he basically says is that the notion of the caliphate, of the khilafa, of the, of the caliph, uh, and, and sort of all of that, is not a religious term, right? That the Khalifa is not a religious term, that Caliphate is not a religious term. It is not a technical religious term. It is just a word in the Arabic language to refer to a type of political entity. Furthermore, the establishment of a Khilafa, of a Caliphate, at a global level is not a directive of Islam. A key principle that Ramdi has that we, if you've been following this uh, discussion uh, from the beginning, a key principle that he has that's part of his methodology as well, and that he's very strict with, is that in order for something to be given the status of religion, it needs to come from the Quran and the Sunnah, from the sources of Islam, right? That to give something sacred status, it must have a basis in Islam's sacred sources, and that is the Quran and the prophetic tradition, the Sunnah. Right? In the case of the Khilafa as a religious term, or the notion that the caliphate has to be established as a, at a global level, there is no proof for that, no sort of basis for that in the sacred sources of Islam. So that cannot be given a kind of religious status and a sacred status. And part of what Ramdi is doing there is, is an important um, methodological uh, sort of move or, or principle, right? Because what he fundamentally understands, and you may not articulate, but fundamentally understands, is that once something gains sacred status, then it becomes very difficult to critique it. And in Ramzi's view, rightfully so, right? So if something gets, is a religious term, is a sacred term, if, if prayer is salat, right? And fasting is psalm, these are religious terms. The Quran has used them, the Sunnah uses it. These are religious terms, they have sacred status. Then changing them or critiquing them is a major thing, right? To change, something that has been given religious status, sacred status by the Quran and the Sunnah is a big deal, right? So those category of things are, need to be protected. But as a result, what ends up happening is in recognition of how powerful it is when you give something religious status or sacred status, this then gets loosely applied elsewhere, including in phenomenon that existed as part of Islamic history that now get given sacred status simply because of their existence in the past. And once they're given that sacred status, the notion of changing them or not working towards them becomes a big deal, right? So what Ramdi, his overall sort of underlying, if you will, argument 
that is running through all this is that we have to be very careful when we decide to make something a religious directive, a religious term, or to give something that level of sacred status. Right? We can only do that when that status is being given by God or God's prophet, peace be upon him. When it's human beings that are coming up with technical terminology to study hadith or to study fiqh, or to study theology, or to study politics that happen to be part of Muslim tradition, that that technical terminology does not automatically become sacred. And this is an incredibly important point. An incredibly important point that applies not simply to the idea of just khilafah not being a religious term, but various other things within the Islamic tradition. These might be great things in the tradition. They may be things that are of incredible value, even good things, right? He's not saying that khilafah is a bad thing. That's absolutely not what he's saying. But he's saying there's a difference between saying that something is a good thing and saying that it is a religious obligation, it is a directive, it is part of uh, the religious objectives you must have as a Muslim, and that it has sacred status. That is a very different level of consideration for something like the idea of khilafah, right? So the second point he makes is no, this does not have any basis in religion to say that the khilafah must be established or that the khilafah itself is a religious term. And he points, we discussed various sort of ways in which he uh, discusses sort of historically how um, that wasn't the case as well. Right? Okay, so now we move into the third point. And the third point he makes, and he spends some time on this, and, and we'll try to as well, is that the basis of nationality in Islam is not Islam itself. All right, let me repeat that. The basis of nationality in Islam is not Islam itself. Let's get into what he's trying to say here. So he notes that, Ramdi notes, there's a huge debate that happens in South Asia in the modern period on this idea. Right? And up to this point, we've talked about the state converting to Islam. We've talked about the idea of Khilafah being kind of a religious directive, etc. Right? And now we're moving into the notion, the nationality within Islam is Islam itself. And Ramdi says, this is simply not the case. Nationality can be based on various things, on race, on color, culture, and even sometimes religion, right? It's possible for nationality to be based on religion, right? But if we say that Islam is the basis of nationality, then we are saying that Muslims don't have the scope to be any other nationality but Muslim. Right? They cannot be Pakistani, they cannot be American, they cannot be Pathan, they can't be Nordic, they can't be all of these things. Right? In Ramdi's view is essentially what scholars are arguing for and what Ramdi is critiquing. Right? Ramdi is saying that, no, in fact, you can be American on the basis of nationality or Afghan on the basis of ethnicity or anything else and Islam has no objection to these different forms of identity. Right? There's nowhere, he says, in the Qur'an or the Hadith where it says that Muslims can only be one people and they must be just one people. What the Qur'an and Hadith said are that believers are brothers to each other, regardless of their identity. Right? From their relationship of faith, they are brothers to each other. Hence, if you're brothers to each other, you should be aware of the condition of your brothers in faith, you should even give, potentially give them preference, you don't close the doors to them, right? You can't cut them off simply because of their national identity and all that stuff. But what it doesn't mean is that they have to give up all those other identities and become one Muslim nation as a religious injunction, right? If they collectively decide that that's a path they want to pursue, that's separate, that's different. That's a different type of decision. But if you're saying it's a religious injunction, an obligation, a directive to do that, that has no basis, right? Lamdi Saab says, look, for instance, if we look in the South Asian context, it was not possible to tell Bengalis 
that they must always associate with Pakistan as a single nation for religious reasons. Because there's no religious basis for this. There was a political decision that was taken and it should have been done on the basis of whatever the realities were on the ground. In Ramdi's view, it wasn't done carefully. And as a result, as a result the relationship ended because it had to end. But that does not mean that Bengalis committed a sin by ending the relationship, by leaving, sort of no longer being East Pakistan and becoming Bangladesh. They didn't do anything against the faith itself. They formed their own country on a different nationality, on their basis of their own unique background, culture and traditions, and there is nothing wrong with that, right? And this has been partly a major issue in recent history, the idea that Islam as a nationality, right? And he talks about sort of how even great thinkers have started using this, right? And have brought up this notion, right? But what Ramdi is saying is that on the basis of religion, you cannot demand that people give up their identities, whether national, ethnic, racial, etc., to become one nation and one state. That might be a political decision that people take, but it is not a demand that's placed on them by their religion, right? Similarly, people can live in non-Muslim states as citizens of non-Muslim states. Religion does not limit you from doing this. The Quran and Hadith forbid none of this. But the traditional narrative in Ramdi's view does not accept this, does not accept the fact that you can do this. First, it will say, the traditional narrative will say, the state must read the Shahada, it must convert. Second, it'll say the caliphate has to be established. And third, it'll say that individual nationalities are unacceptable, that Islam has to be our nationality. And this is the phenomenon that he's describing that is essentially, at, I would say, so these are sort of my ideas, at the, at the heart of where the the discourse around political Islam has been, right? And we know it in the United States as well, right? We're at a different place in our discussion here in the United States among Muslim Americans than we were 20 years ago or even 30 years ago, right? We've gone through this challenge in this country where for a long period of time, there was a demand almost made on indigenous members of the American Muslim community, specifically African Americans, there was a demand on them to give up their identity as black people in America, as African Americans in this country, to give up that identity, to give up all the traditions and culture and everything that came with that in order to be absorbed into some generic, general Muslim identity, right? And even that, of course, was premised on sort of either an Arab or a South Asian basis, a quote unquote historically Muslim culture, right? But we went through this period of doing that, right? In this country, in, in the United States. We went through a period of making that type of demand, right? And we did it, potentially even maybe at times with good intention, right? to promote a notion of unity, that all unity can only come when we give up and shed all these other identities and only think of ourselves as Muslim. But in fact, that itself was in part disingenuous, right? Because even our definition of what it meant to be Muslim oftentimes carried the cultural traits, the identity traits of specific Muslim cultures in the world. And what we had realized over time, or slowly have realized, is that no, in fact, this idea that is promoted as part of the traditional narrative and particularly part of the sort of political Islam narrative in the modern period, that there can be no individual nationalities, right? That Islam is our only nationality, that this idea uh, is quite challenging. It still exists, it's still present. And Ramdi articulates a critique of this by basically stating that, no, this has no basis in religion. You cannot give this type of directive as a religious directive because there is no such thing within the Islamic sources that demand that one give up all these other identities, all these other sort of 
individual nationalities, if you will. Okay. So, and his discussion of this point, Hamdi elaborates further. Right? We'd been talking about prior to this, or Hamdi did, and we had spoken in the last session, about the fact that we've moved out of the era of empire and now are in the age of nation states. And these nation states appear in different forms. Some are more developed, others are just emerging. They're still vestiges of empire or so, like signs of monarchy, etc. that are still there. But generally speaking, we are in the era of nation states or republic. And the basis of these nation states, generally speaking, is territory. As empires ended, they divided and they formed identity based around specific territory. Right? You take historic India, for instance, and now its various parts consist of territory that's known as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, etc., various other nation states based around certain territory. You also have nation states that have tried to form where the basis is on ethnicity. Kurdistan might be an example. Right? There are various examples of this as well. Right? But generally speaking, it's territory. And it historically used to be based on ethnicity and tribes, etc. However, now it's moved in a different direction. And if you have nationality based on territory, Ramdi Saab says, then, then there will have to be a principle that whether I am Muslim or Christian or Hindu or if I'm Afghan or Anglo-Saxon or whatever ethnicity you might have that are separate from all these other entity identities, the territory itself will give rise to a nation state identity, right? So as a result of that, somebody who is from, or from the land of Saudi Arabia can say that they're Saudi Arabian, others can say they're Pakistani, they're American, that there won't be a debate about what their origin is or what their religion is, that they're from this territory, from a particular nation state, that can be the basis of their national identity, right? Now, what Ghamdi says is that if we take all this, if we understand all this, then an important question gets raised for the religious Muslim, right? Can we accept this type of basis for national identity, right? Before the emergence of Pakistan, and he uses Pakistan as an example because he, he feels in many respects that the subcontinent really brings to life many of these key issues, right? He says, before the emergence of Pakistan, this debate caused some serious conflict between two of the region's major thinkers. The question arose at the time when the British were going to leave India as to whether India would remain united or divided. If it remained united, it needed to be based on an Indian nationality that transcended all of the other identities in that territory, right? If India was to be united, there had to be some transcendent identity based on Indian, uh, on that territory that they were in, right? For a republic to form, this really was the only option. The alternative would be to, you know, find a ruler, establish a new type of empire. However, this didn't really happen. Right? Instead, you now have a territory with numerous identities based on religion, ethnicity, etc. Now, on that basis then, the question came up, all right, how do we sort of divide up this country? Or how do we sort of, not so much divide up this country, but how, how are we going to sort of conceive of our identity in this space? Right? How are we going to conceive of our identity in this space? On this point, one of the major Islamic scholars of the Indian subcontinent, Maulana Hussein Ahmed Madani, said while on the pulpit that we live in a time where societies are built on territorial identity. And as a result, since we are all here in this territory of India, our collective identity within the nation state must be as Indians regardless of what other religious, cultural, or ethnic identities we might have. He noted that we must exist in this state as, space as Indian nationals. Right? Now, we might listen to this today and think, all right, this, is, this doesn't seem particularly radical. Right? But you have to understand at that point in time, historically speaking, you're just a few, not too far removed from the ending of the caliphate, 
right, of movements that still exist in the Indian subcontinent at that point to try to reestablish the caliphate. That there is that notion that's still present. You're also in a context where you're coming out of British colonialism, where people are very closely identified with their religious faith. You're Hindu, you're Muslim, you're Sikh, whatever else in this space, right? So the idea of people, regardless of their other identities that have been highlighted and pushed and, and used as divide and conquer to some degree, uh, or quite a large degree within the British Empire, that now we can exist in the space as Indian nationals. This, in some respects, proved to be some quite a radical idea among Muslims. Right? In response to this, there was a severe critique. And one of the most prominent examples was the critique that came from the thinker and the poet uh, Alama Muhammad Iqbal, who composed some harsh poetic stanzas against Madani's position. Right? And that, those stanzas, that, that poetry roughly translated, and I, I can only do a rough translation, it was in, in Farsi, this is based on Ramdi's sort of translation of it, right? is that Iqbal says, Huh, sitting on that pulpit, he, Madani, has said that a people are formed on the basis of territory. How incredibly uninformed is this person of the position of the Arab named Muhammad? What can be more shocking than an institution like the Dioband and a scholar like Hussein Madani could speak in this manner? Right? That's a pretty harsh critique. Essentially saying that Madani, this major scholar of Islam, was uninformed, incredibly uninformed about the thought, the ideas, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That's essentially what Iqbal is saying in this. And not only is he going after Madani, but goes after the Dioband. Right? For Iqbal, definition of nation states on the basis of territory was a death nail of religion. It was the end of religion. For him, Islam itself was the basis of nationality. And he speaks of this position in his poetry, in his writings, etc. Right? This was a time when there was a real movement of potential separation from India on the basis of religious identity. So these ideas of Iqbal's took off. They took, had even greater weight. Maulana Maududi writes a book at this time discussing the issue of national identity and supporting Iqbal's position. And he points as an example, not from the Qur'an, not from the Sunnah necessarily, but says that the Hijra of Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Mecca to Medina was indicative of the point that while there was a uniform national identity in Mecca, Hijra was done to establish a new society that was based on religion as the nationality. So that is where this debate takes place. And Madani, for his part, in Ramzi's view, was really making an argument saying that essentially, yeah, there's nothing in religion that prevents us from having identity as Indians based on this territory. But Iqbal, who himself was not a religious scholar, right, his ideas and the emotions behind it essentially capture and captivate even the scholarly class around this idea. And in the next session, inshallah, we'll continue to dis discuss this idea to put some more meat around it and sort of strengthen and clarify really that point that Hamdi is making here with regard to what, what is this, what is the meaning of this, that Islam needs to be the nationality, that, that people's nationality needs to be Muslim, right? Uh, and what's the significance of that? Look forward to the next session. وآخر الدعوة والحمد لله رب العالمين.